Hello class, today we're going to talk about chapters 21 through 23, and this is the start of the Baroque period. Now with chapter 21, we're talking about voicing gender, especially women composers in Baroque Italy. In the Baroque period, which runs from 1600 to 1750, um, there are very few possibilities for women to be creative. Um, and for example, um, one route was to be a operatic professional. Um, however, uh, women who were performers in this realm um, had character and morality issues um, that people questioned because um, a proper woman would be married and at home, not out performing and um, being on the, in the courts and, and that kind of lifestyle. Um, the, the second uh, option for women were to uh, continue their musical abilities through the convents. Um, you know, and one example is of um, at St. Uh, Radegonda, um, there's a Benedictine convent in Milan. Here we have a picture of a chorus of nuns singing in the French Abbey of Port Royal de Champs as depicted by Louise Magdalene Hortemels from 1688 to 1667. Um, so women who were unmarried and wanted to save their dignity, if you will, um, went into the, the, the monastic lifestyle where they could continue their musical endeavors as composers and singers. And a lot of these um, nuns were really great singers. A lot of people would attend all the special masses and celebrations just to hear them sing. Okay, so the first of two women that we're going to talk about is Chiara Margherita uh, Cozzolani, who was born in 1602, died in 1676. She was a Benedictine nun and composer. She was the youngest daughter of a wealthy Milanese merchant and took her religious vows at age 18. In the convent, she took on an active role in music, especially as a choir director and composer. And her works were published and circulated beyond the convent. And this is, you know, the first time that a woman's compositions were starting to be seen as on the same uh, level, I guess, as male composers, especially in the religious sacred music. But it was also a way for her to... Um, gain notoriety, I guess, in a, in a positive way, um, rather than being a street musician or court musician and still have her dignity. Um, let's see. She had three collections of published music. One of them was a collection of Vespers. And remember when we talked about um, the medieval mass and the Renaissance mass, the Vespers is the evening um, office or mass of prayers. Um, and uh, she also composed motets and dialogues. Later on, she became the abbess and prioress at St. Radegonda. This next slide is the in the ecstasy of St. Teresa which was created in 1652, sculpted by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the nun experiences both extreme pain from the sword of the angel and through divine intervention, a great love of God. Now, during the Baroque period, even though there was a lot of extravagance and drama, you know, within the music, within the writing, within the culture, um, the people were very devout and still put a lot of praise and prayer on the Virgin Mary. And Kozolani's Magnificat uh, was a canticle of Mary. It's a 
virgin song of praise um, from the Gospel of Luke. And there were two Magnificats by Kozolani. Uh, these were large scale polychoral settings with an organ continuum. Now, when I say polychoral, that means there's more than one choir in the piece. And um, this music was dramatic and mystical, and it intensifies the nun's experience. So um, with this story, uh, the Virgin Mary is um, getting the news that she's about to have a child, and, um, you know, she's very happy and feeling blessed and joy um, as being, you know, worthy of God's attention, God's love to bring in um, Christ. And um, in the way the nuns kind of kind of shared that same, I guess, love in a way, and the, the nuns could relate to the Virgin Mary. And with this Magnificat, um, they were able to kind of bring that connection together. Um, now there are contrasts in the performance groups and the textures and the timbres. Now the performance is sung by nuns, and this was very new and important because with sacred music, women weren't uh, allowed or worthy of singing mu sacred music. And um, at this time, the nuns at this um, St. Radagonda uh, were, were doing that. Here we have a, a manuscript um, painting. Uh, Radagunda withdrawing to the monastery, and this is from the 11th century. This is titled The Life of Saint Radagunda. So back to Kozolani's Magnificat. This was published in 1650, and it has two choirs with four voices each and an organ continuum. The organ continuum is the accompaniment that you hear. And for the meter, um, we have both duple and triple meters, and it's varied tempos. Um, there are virtuosic duets that interrupt the large choral forces, and the refrains bring back lines of text and music, so a lot of words get repeated, and it closes with a doxology. So with the refrains that of those lines that are repeated, we hear, my soul glorifies the Lord, then we also hear, he has done great things for me. And um, the music here is highly expressive with rich word painting. Now here's the breakdown from the Listening Guide 10. And as you can see, we see that the, the melody is lyrical with small range duets and static choral lines. Um, the rhythm and meter shifts between duple and triple. And the harmony generally is consonant with some dissonance in the solo passages. The texture shifts between homophonic ensembles and two voice duets with some imitation. So remember homophonic, the, the lines that are being sung generally move together. They might be slightly staggered, but um, it's not really polyphonic where we have independent lines. And the form, um, we have a refrain that brings back several lines of text or music. And the expression, we have varied tempos. Some sections uh, move more freely. The performing forces are two soprano soloists and two double choirs with the soprano, alto, tenor, bass parts with organ and strings. Now remember the SATB, you know, in today's terms, you know, we have the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass voice, but because this is an all women's choir, even though there were men present at this um, monastery, this convent, 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 sorry, um, the men did not participate with the women. They didn't mix genders. So for this piece, it's all women's voices, and since the bass voice is too low, they would have sung it up an octave. And the text is from Luke 1, 46 to 55. Here we have the um, repeated text and music. 
and then we have the doxology closing um, at the end. Now our second female composer is Barbara Strozzi, um, and she was prevalent in the Baroque aria. Uh, Barbara Strozzi was born 1619 to 1677, and she was a secular singer and composer. It was also rumored that she was probably the illegitimate daughter of a Venetian poet slash playwright named Giulio Strozzi. Now, um, she had an unusual educational and performance opportunities being um, closely affiliated with the Venetian Academy. Now, the secular arias um, were usually about suffering of unfulfilled love. And like I said before, women in music at this time had two, two options to either go into the convent to perform and write, or they were associated with the opera and the courts and the courtesan kind of lifestyle. So it was very unsavory uh, and reputations were, were damaged in that sense. Um, but uh, as a composer, as a female composer writing, you know, about, you know, unfulfilled love and and, and the emotions that come with it, um, she was able to uh, still perform while, while keeping her, her composure, if you will, for, for, the, um, for the audiences. Um, so her, because of her affiliation with her father, um, he would have these performances or host these performances where she got to um, play and compose and, and spread her music that way. Um, she composed eight volumes of vocal music and um, they were published in her lifetime. Eight volumes. That was a lot. She was the most um, prolific singer composer um, it, during her time period, more so than in the, the men at, at that time. Here we have a picture here. Um, this is a well dressed woman, and is, she's probably a courtesan. So um, the courtesans were educated women who. Um, were around or present or hired or you know was part of their vocation to um, uh, please men intellectually, um, musically, you know, and through the arts and as well as sexually. So that's why um, to be an upstanding woman, you needed to be married and you know or in the convent or married and and, and staying at home. But women who weren't doing that were considered part of the courtesan lifestyle. So yes, this painting is a well-dressed woman who is probably a courtesan making music with her clients. This painting is titled Musical Entertainment by Sebastiano Florigerio. And here we have a picture of Barbara Strossi and the attire worn at that time. All right, so lesson guide 11. This is Strozzi's Amor Dorm Dormiglione, and this translates to Sleepyhead Cupid. This was published in 1651, and it's a monody where we have a solo soprano with harpsichord or a bass lute. And it has the form of a da capo aria where we have an A section, then a B section, and then back to the A section. And um, this song was a invocation to the god of love, Cupid. And um, it has a, uses word painting like some of the other pieces we talked about. So when, when we see Cupid's arrows in the text, the melody moves upward as if Cupid shot the arrow. And then Cupid's laziness we see a static melody. So basically in this song, um, this person's trying to wake up Cupid and make him do you know, what he needs to do. And so you know, he has to be you know, aroused or woken up several times. And so you can see the melody when he's being lazy and doesn't wanna get up. Um, and it's really cool how um, she uses word painting there. 
So here's the breakdown. Um, we have for the melody, um, it's a rising opening and uh, the lines are shaped to express the text. <clears throat> the meter is um, a lilting, so not really a strong triple meter, but just like a little, little dip, you know, to, for the emphasis of beat one. And uh, a, there's a brief switch to duple in, at the beginning of the second section, the B section. Now the harmony is consonant with some uh, chromaticism. Now, um, a lot of the music during the Baroque era um, will be consonant with maybe some splashes of dissonance or ch chromaticism, if you will, um, because that helps to um, stir the emotions and, and, and bring the drama. Now, the texture is homophony, so, or homophony, and um, it's a song that's accompanied and the form, like I said before, is the capo aria, which has the um, three parts, the A, B, and then the return to the A section. And the performing forces is a solo soprano with harpsichord or a bass lute. And the text is an, an anonymous Italian poem. Now, one of the things about this, this song is that um, the point of view of the person singing uh, even though it's a female's voice, uh, it is gender neutral. Um, a lot of the music during the Baroque era by male composers was through, um, through their their lens of what women or you know or men should should act. <clears throat> and here is the text. And as you can see, in the opening of, of the line here, um, that the, 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 the melodic line is moving upwards. 